independent international research within the framework of the project Kaleidoscope of Facts. Did Atlantis exist? Facts and proofs in monuments, legends, and scientific evidence. How did people live in Atlantis? What kind of society did they have? Who was El? What technologies did the Atlanteans possess? What did the ancients know about artificial consciousness? How did this all end? Where did Atlantis disappear? A 12,000 year cycle, detailed facts about climate cycles around the world. Will our civilization suffer the same fate of Atlantis or? We will review these and other topics at the International Conference of a Unique Format, Kaleidoscope of Facts. Hello, dear friends. We are pleased to welcome you today to the 13th September to live broadcast of Alatra TV at the second international conference within the frame of the unique project called Kaleidoscope of Facts. We take a basis one of the broadcasts published on the channel TV of Alatra TV with the participation of Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. To deepen the topic and find information to reveal the truth, because this is the essence of this lecture series, returning the truth to the people. Were there more highly developed civilizations than now? Did Atlantis exist? The legends about the super-advanced antediluvian civilization, which was situated in the far west on a large island surrounded by water, the country the powerful influence of which once spread all over the world. And today I am honored to introduce you our special guest, outstanding speaker, and author, researcher, YouTube vlogger, Matt LaCroix. Matt spent thousands of hours making research on the topic of Atlantis, and he's going to share with us his key findings. Matt, welcome to the show, and what does story of Atlantis means to you? Thanks, it's great to be here with all these wonderful conscious minds. For me, Atlantis has been almost an obsession since I've been a child. The idea of these lost civilizations being long ago destroyed in our past has always fascinated me. Helping to redefine how we view our entire history and even who we are. And so for me, Atlantis is very dear to my heart. And so a lot of people, when I go up and talk to them about Atlantis and discuss, discuss these topics, they're surprised often when they learn that one of the greatest, most renowned philosophers in history, known as Plato, extensively wrote about Atlantis. And yet, in our culture of choosing these nuggets of truth versus what we think is just a myth or a theory, they, it, uh, mainstream um, experts often discard uh, Plato's descriptions of Atlantis as being just a myth woven into this story that never really existed. Well, wh whereas when you start to break down these writings of Plato, you find that he gives very descriptive analysis of this great place that once is existed that when I do ancient research and studying across these um, ruins and ancient megalithic structures around the world, it seems that these cultures were all connected at one time to this lost knowledge that in many ways we're st still trying to regain today. And so what we're going to do is we're going to break down the Timaeus and Critias and do some readings directly from them so that everybody can hear exactly what Plato said about Atlantis. And instead of just having someone tell you what they think he said. So what we're going to do is start with what's known as the Timaeus. So where did that story come from? To give a little background. Plato was an Athenian philosopher who knew about another Athenian statesman and poet and philosopher named Solon. And this is where the story really begins, because Solon spent a considerable amount of time in Egypt in 590 BC. 
And he was there studying Egyptian ancient writings, and he found this entire story about, about Atlantis. Now, for those who don't know, it makes complete sense that that was where he would find that knowledge, considering that Egypt at the time had some of the oldest writings known to mankind. Many people are familiar with the Library of Alexandria that was burned down later by the Romans. But what that tells us is that Egypt contained these ancient records from our past. They really give us a glimpse into, well, what was Atlantis? How is it connected to some of these lost civilizations and global societies that once existed that had sophisticated knowledge and technologies that in some ways we don't even have today? So I'm going to read a, I'm going to read a section from the Timaeus to, to get us started to understand what Atlantis was and where was it and, and the description of what happened to it. So beginning in the Timaeus, it states, For the ocean there was at that time navigable. For in front of the mouth, which you Greeks call, you say, the pillories of Hercules, there lay an island, which was larger than Libya and Asia together. It was possible for travelers of that time to cross from it to other islands, and from the islands to the whole continent, over against them, which encompasses the variability of the ocean. For all that we have been here, lying within the mouth of which we speak, is evidently having a narrow entrance, but that yonder is a real ocean, and the land surrounding it most rightly be called, in the fullest and truest sense, a continent. Now in this island of Atlantis, there existed a confederation of kings, of great and marvelous power, which held sway over all the island, and over many other islands, also in parts of the continent. So right away we find out that instead of this, this myth, we're learning about this great civilization, not on just some little island that disappeared, but an entire continent connected to other islands that played a huge role in our past and our history. And it goes on to mention how these great kings carried on and ruled over the people and had great power. And that's what we're going to get into a little deeper. But as we go along, we find out even more descriptive analysis of Atlantis when we get into the Critias. The Critias really is the heart of where Plato describes that Egyptian knowledge of what Atlantis was. And so let's lay the framework. I'm going to start with just a little bit of the beginning of the Critias, and then we'll get into some of the um, description of what happened to Atlantis. But it begins by saying, it, Plato describes how Atlantis was Poseidon carved out of a mountain, a great palace enclosed by moats, of various width, essentially. And he talks about how Atlantis was separated by these moats of water with circular islands of land. And we'll get into that in a second. And he goes on to mention how the center of the island was a great temple known as the Temple of Poseidon. And, and on and on, how great land bridges connected Atlantis and how it was, a, it was a center of trade and commerce in the region. And so reading directly from the Critias, he goes on after he describes it all, and we'll, and we'll go over, over that in a second. He goes on to describe what happened to Atlantis. And so in the Critias, I'm going to read directly from it. It states, But afterwards, there occurred violent earthquakes and floods. And in a single day and night of misfortune, all of your warlike men in a body sank into the earth, and the island of Atlantis, in like manner, disappeared in the depths of the sea. For which reason the sea in those parts is impassable? And impenetrable, because there is a shoal of mud in the way, and this was caused by the subsidence of the island. Okay, so let's break that down for a second for a minute. As I said before, Plato describes how Atlantis was a large continent found west of the Pillars of Hercules. For those who study, they know that the Pillars of Hercules was this known as the Straits of Gibraltar. Now, west of that area, just northwest of, of Morocco, Africa, we find all these different island chains that are still left over, found what's along what's called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, an area where tectonic plates come together and can be a violent area for earthquakes and volcanism and, and huge tsunamis if you get violent earth changes. And so today, when, when I look at that region and I look at what, how he described Atlantis, it brings up questions like, as in, you know, were the Azores, Canary Islands, were these what parts of Atlantis? So what, what Plato essentially says is, states that Atlantis had a central island surrounded by two circular island landmasses with three areas of water. Now, where it was built 
wasn't actually on a small island surrounded by ocean, but actually on the continent itself. And it describes how there was a, a narrow area of land that was connecting from the ocean to this area of, of central land masses in an island in the center. So ships would essentially come from the ocean and they would travel up through this narrow, narrow area that was heavily guarded. And that he, he later describes as sinking and submerging into the ocean and completely disappearing and, and leaving nothing behind except an, a shoal of mud that is impassable by ships. And so that's, he basically tells us that Atlantis in a day and a night was completely wiped out and destroyed. And that really is the heart of the evidence we have from Plato. But the story doesn't end there. The story of Atlantis really begins with the sinking and the wars that occurred during that time period. But, but the story of Atlantis is carried on and the sophistication of Atlantis is carried on in, into Egypt. What we find is when we get into other ancient writings, one of them called the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, we get more descriptions about Atlantis that even gives, gives us a better glimpse into some of the details of what Atlantis was. So for, some, for those who don't know, Thoth was an ancient Egyptian priest who was one of the most important in all of Egyptian history. Now, during that time period, Egypt wasn't called Egypt. We're looking at different epics of, of ancient civilizations. So when we think of the dynastic pharaohs, Tutankhamun and Ramses, we have to think about a, an earlier culture that predated them, that were the ones largely responsible for building all the sophisticated structures in Egypt, like the Great Pyramids of Giza. However, back then, Egypt wasn't called Egypt. It was called Kemet, or the land of Kem, which was derived from the alchemy, the name alchemy itself, Al-Kem, which represented a place of sophisticated knowledge and wisdom, knowing how to transmutate metals and how to play around with the laws of, of the laws of reality to create these incredible structures that we still can't replicate today. So what happened essentially was when Atlantis was being destroyed and sinking into the ocean, a lot, uh, part of that society that had been pure and good and had the values of the old golden, the golden years, they call them, the golden age that occurred before when Atlantis thrived and prospered, before it became corrupted, that group left the island before it was destroyed. And they wanted to bring that technology and knowledge to other places where it could survive because they knew that it was being destroyed and being corrupted. And so Thoth states that he wasn't an ancient priest at that time, but he was someone who lived in Atlantis. And he eventually rose up to become a very prominent figure and then traveled to this land of Kem to create this new Atlantis. And so what he states in his first Emerald Tablet, which is essentially the wisdom of, of Atlantis that they wanted to carry on and continue to today, which was originally found in the Great Pyramid of Giza, states, Emerald Tablet number one, I, Thoth the Atlantean, Masters of mysteries, keeper of records, mighty king, magician, living from generation to generation, being about to paw pass into the halls of Amente, set down for the guidance of those who come after, these records of the mighty wisdom of great Atlantis. In the great city of Kior, on the island of Undal, in a time far past, I began this incarnation, not as the little men of the present age did, the mighty ones of Atlantis live and die, but rather from eon to eon did they renew their life in the halls of Amente, where the river of life flows eternally onward. A hundred times ten have I descended the dark way that led into light, and as many times have I descended from the darkness into the light, my strength and power renewed. Now for a time I descend, and the men of Kem shall know me no more, but in a time yet unborn will I rise again, mighty and potent, requiring an accounting of those that left behind me. So in that description, he tells us that, hey, Plato's description of Atlantis was dead on. There was a central island in the center, but instead of Plato not giving us the name of that island or details of it, Thoth does. He says that the central island was called Undal, and that the central city on that island was known as Kior, and that that's where he began this incarnation, later to form to create the great civilizations of pre-Egypt, known as Kem or Kemet. And then he goes on, I'm going to read one more part from that. He goes on to state in Emerald Tablet number 8, uh, some very inf important information about Atlantis that was the reason for its downfall. 
he says in, in the la in one of the last tablets, far in the past, before Atlantis existed, men there who delved into darkness using dark magic called up beings from the great deep below us. Forth came they into our cycle. Form formless were they of another vibration, is ex existing unseen by the children of earth men. Only through blood could they have formed being. Only through man could they live in the world. In ages past were they conquered by masters, driven down to the place whence they came. But some there who remained, hidden in spaces, in plains unknown to man, lived they in Atlantis as shadows. But as times, they appeared as among men. So just to conclude that little description of Atlantis, we find both where it was located, the description exactly of how big it was, the, the island ratios and how large these moats were, this, the island landmass in the center, how it was, like, it was connected to this global society of trade, and but also how there was great darkness that existed that eventually corrupted Atlantis by certain kings, which eventually would lead to its downfall and destruction. And so we get this really amazing look back into a place that many consider just a myth, but really it's the heart of our past and our history. Thank you, Matt, for, um, for this uh, review. So um, what Plato was writing, especially, thank you for commenting on the part where Egypt, uh, you're describing Egypt. I would like to add a few words and say that actually also um, Herodot, was mentioning such a place and such a the people as Atlanteans who were living next to the mountain Atlas. Could you please uh, show the first slide? You can see there, you can see there that next to the Atlantic Sea, which was previously called Atlantic Ocean, we see the Atlas Mountain. It is to the left in the center. Also Herodot, was um, um, was given the name to Hercules uh, pillars that are now called the um, Hebraulter. And there was uh, a people who did not eat meat and who did not have any dreams. And actually this people named its mountain as a pillar of paradise, which was going far, far up. And you couldn't see its uh, mountaintop, neither in the summer nor in the winter. We also know that uh, this scientist, Herodotus, this historian, uh, was traveling in Egypt and he was recording everything that, uh, uh, the, um, that uh, people told him. He got the name the father of history, but not just the father of history, but also the father of lies, because he did not double check what he was told. Because when you read the history of the Atlantis, you can rarely hear that uh, there are these mentions. Next, I wanted to um, speak about the um, Jesuit monk. His name is Afanasi Kircher. So he placed the Atlantis island near the Azorian island. And um, we saw this uh, part in this uh, in the movie, and he made it into his book Mundi Subterrani. So there was this cover for the book Mundi Subterrani, the underground world, and actually. In it, he described, as far as I understood, he, des he described some underground sources, some reservoirs, and how the Earth looked from, uh, from the inside. And as far as I understood, Afanasi was collecting uh, records from different uh, monks, and he was publishing together with his works. Uh, so together with other um, Jesuit monks, so they were doing the research. He was learning the ancient Greek language and he was reading the Plato works in the original. And he was also studying other ancient languages. But what's interesting is that not everyone was able to appreciate the talent of Afanasi. And for example, Rene Descartes uh, was calling him um, a fraud, not a scientist. And um, there is no way for us to comment on that. but. Afanasi was the first person who to place Atlantis as an island. 
as far as we know, in the region of the Azores. Also, I wanted to comment a little bit about the American lawyer and politician Ignatius Danelli. Some people call him the father of the Atlantology. So he started to use science and research to delve deeper into the history of the Atlantis. So he started to collect facts, he wanted to mix them, and he did a comprehensive study. And in this study, he placed Atlantis near the Azores, and he also, for example, we have his map here on the left, and in the screenshot from his book, you can see uh, the map of the um, of the floor, the sea floor in that region. And also Ignatius Danelli uh, wrote the book called Ragnarok, The Age of Fire and Gravel. And actually, this uh, book was developing the, the idea of catastrophe. So some 12,000 years ago, some um, celestial body f fell and it caused some kind of cataclysm and this work inspired Gans Gerberg to its to his age cosmogony and as we know from history Rexfer of SS Heinrich Himmler was uh, a fan of and now I would like to give the floor to Anastasia Anastasia will show you some other maps that we've managed to uncover Nasty, the floor is yours Indeed, it's a very interesting topic and really can do their own analysis. And Matt already mentioned that there are facts of the location of this island. So we've come to the conclusion that Atlantis most likely was located right on uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. First of all, here, unfortunately, we got only literary records of the Atlantis and the location of this island, but the precise geographic coordinates, uh, this is what we lack. But nevertheless, we can uh, refer to the maps which we managed to find. And first of all, these are the maps uh, of the American researcher James Churchward. He studied the continent new and uh, he made a drawing, a hand, hand, hand drawing based on his visits of Hassa in Tibet, where he also collected records and information about the continent new. And here in this map, you can see the continent new, which is uh, probably which was probably ruined and vanished before Atlantis and we see Atlantis and also in the territory of contemporary South America we can see the Amazonian Sea. The researcher himself says that the Atlantis, Atlantis was present in that place but if we pay attention to the maps which were previously of course we can uh, talk about uh, mentioned Kirchheim, which uh, whom Alexander already mentioned. In 17th century, he also played Atl placed Atlantis in the Atlantic Ocean. And next, we see a number of researchers who also refer to the same location on the map. What would I like to pay your to draw your attention to? If we look, if you look at these maps, basically what we can see is the modern direct geographical map. The modern world as we know it and precise outlines of the continents right now. And here we should understand a thousand years ago, there was an ice age on Earth and there was a tremendous caps of ice that were, that were covering Earth in the north and in the south. So a part of the Earth could have been covered. The water was located in a, in a firm state, in a frozen state. States. So the level of the world ocean was two to three hundred lower than the current level of the ocean. Also, we should do adjustment to the tectonic changes because the coastal area could not look exactly like the coastal area on the maps which we see right now. In this respect, the remarkable point is the map which we mentioned uh, during the last conference. It's an Ecuador map. It's a tremendous stone piece on which actually the continents were drawn. We can see this stone and with the map 
on this image. And basically, it dates back to at least 9,000 years ago, probably this map even older than 12,000 years ago. And we definitely see the outlines, the contours of a continent. And we can easily guess the American continent, and even we can see the Gulf of California there. And also, the outlines, the contours of this continent, they differ. Could you please show the previous slide? On this map, we can see that uh, there are two islands which are now not in the map. One is uh, to the east of the Latin America and the other one is to the west from Latin America. And we believe that this island, which is to the east from America, is exactly Atlantis. If we com uh, co compare this stone map with the map, uh, the current uh, bachymetrical map, we can see that on the bachymetrical map, uh, near the Azore Islands and to the south, there is a huge area which was probably uh, a hill, uh, was an elevation, and probably this whole mapping material and all the written records which are available from all these materials, we can say that the major version of the location of Atlantis is exactly at Atlantic Ocean and the region which we've uh, noted on the biometric map. But the girls, uh, Lisa and Olga, have prepared a, a great research on where Atlantis was located. Yes, thank you very much, Anastasia. We really analyzed the geological, biological, and paleontological, archaeological, and archaeological evidence of the fact that Atlantis was indeed inside uh, near uh, inside the Atlantic Ocean, where Anastasia showed us near Azor Azor Islands. And uh, what we uh, asked us first of all. Given uh, the tremendous uh, size of Atlantis, of this island, we ask ourselves whether it was a continent or it was an island, uh, or it was a continent like Australia. Uh, you see the Earth's core of the continents and of the islands differs in the depths and in the composition of this crust. The continent of Atlantis, if it was a continent, and the crust should be of a different composition. We can find evidence of that in the crust's composition. Uh, Maria Klonova, Soviet geologist, was one of the founders of marine geology. She wrote in 1948 that a tremendous continental cloud was uh, submerged uh, to, uh, under the level of the sea near the Canary Islands, Azores, and the Capo Verde. And also, she mentions that uh, this information is um, was mentioned only on various maps. But later on, such a model, when the continental clot goes down, uh, this model actually contradicts uh, to the theory of the static uh, of the geostatic balance of the uh, Earth. Is a static balance implies that the thicker is the core, the crust, the deeper it is uh, lowered into the Earth's crust. Alexander Moisevich Korodnitsky, a geophysicist, professor and doctor of mineralogical sciences and member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, a member of the society that studies Atlantis, wrote in 1988. Unfortunately, facts indicate that in the ocean there are no submerged pieces of the continental crust, and this kind of contradicts the existence of Atlantis. Well, continents indeed can submerge, but what about archipelagos? Could you please show us the next slide? Alexander Gardnitsky calculated and uh, with which um, speed uh, the former islands of Ampere and Josephine were submerging. They are located uh, uh, opposite the Strait of Gibraltar, and uh, he saw that these territories were submerging much faster than they were supposed to, according to geophysical processes. 
The same conclusion was made by American scientists who also studied the Atlantis uh, underground mountain. They wrote that these islands were submerged very fast, which uh, just does not comply with any series of how ocean processes are taking place. What made them submerge so fast? Uh, the scientists of the Soviet society of the study Atlantis, they were amazed that some continental crust, continental plate can submerge with such a speed. And actually, there are no analogs of such a process in history, but in, uh, in fact, it could have happened. Oh, basically, very interesting is the composition of these areas, which Anastasia mentioned. It's uh, close to the northwest of Azores. And it's quite intriguing for the geologists, they cracking their brain on how the zone actually appeared. Could you please show the next slide? And then we will show the slide five. Actually, here we can see the three oceanic plates, North American, European, and African plates. There is a junction of them. And uh, you see this uh, triple junction, which is also called the Azor Geo syndrome. It's a very unusual place. And also, also, as Anastasia mentioned, according to topographical maps, we can see that here the relief uh, is elevated. That's, that's why this place is called the Azor elevation. What is unusual about the geology of this place? First of all, there is an anomaly of the depth of the ocean. The uh, ocean bed, the ocean floor is elevated compared to other places. Also, there is an uh, increased thickness of the ocean waters. Um, basically, normally the ocean crust uh, is two uh, to seven kilometers, but here it is twice uh, thicker. Also, there is gravitational anomalies and actually gravitational anomaly, gravitational field anomalies. This is relates to Iceland. We know that Iceland is uh, not submerged. Uh, we can see an island, but in the Azor area, we cannot see any island, any elevation above the sea level, but the uh, gravitational field uh, is the same. Also, there are other anomalies which scientists cannot explain otherwise, but the fact that there are microplates in this area, you see that rocks usually remember the magnetic field activity when they were crystallized. But you're, um, near this Azor plateau, uh, there are areas which cannot be, you know, traced according to the magnetic history. Also, the speed of the movement of this plate is quite interesting and unusual. And also, below the uh, Azor plateau, uh, there are very interesting points which geologists cannot explain either. As I mentioned, this a whole area of the Azor plateau is very similar to the Iceland. Um, crust built, but Iceland is above the surface, but in the Azor area there are volcanic anomalies and geochemical anomalies, uh, which uh, make it different from the Iceland area. And in the end of this geological part, I would like to say that the samples which were taken from the ocean crust, uh, they, it was quite limited, only uh, in the in line with this uh, under, underwater mountain. For some reason, uh, scientists were limited in studying this terror. Another question which we ask ourselves, what can be, could be the relief of Atlantis that submerged and uh, how this relief could show that Atlantis was actually above the, uh, above the surface of the ocean? What was the relief, the landscape of this area? According to Plato, the island was a kind of a, a rectangular shape. It was, uh, it was uh, enveloped with mountains, and in the middle there was a grandiose channel about 25 meters in depth and about 1,000 1, meters in length. Also, there, are, there were little rivers, and basically it's a quite bright, vivid uh, relief. This is what we got from plate, so that uh, there's a big channel uh, in, the Atl in Atlantis. Could you please show us the previous slide? You see, near the Azores plateau, 
uh, there is uh, a channel on the seabed and uh, because this is the exactly the place of the junction of three tectonic plates and it's also very interesting if you look at this slide this same relief looks on the surface in iceland on the dry land you can see that it's the shape is kind of uh, elongated uh, the same as plato plato described uh, about atlantis and basically uh, this is what is discovered in uh, near the azor islands yes it was uh, an uh, a mountain range which uh, was actually starting from the Iceland and was stretching all the way along the Atlantic Ocean. Plato actually described it. Also, uh, Christian Brain, the American archaeologist and geologist, mentioned that Azor archipelago uh, was a, a massive of mountains which was equal uh, to Spain in its size and. Uh, one of the rivers on this place was uh, about uh, with the length of about 288 kilometers now i give the floor to olga my colleague and she will uh, tell us what streams uh, sea ocean streams were uh, uh, around atlantis and what is it uh, how it is the um, proved in geology right now yes indeed there are facts that indicate that in the Atlantic Ocean, there was supposed to be an island, and this is mentioned by a mathematician and this Hagemeister. She mentioned that in the Atlantic Ocean, there used to be a dry land that participated in the movement of warm waters in the polar area. And when Atlantis was destroyed, this dream was supposed to be directed to the Europe, which is Gulf Stream, which now determines the warm climate of Europe. Also, uh, this fact is confirming that the destruction of Atlantis and the global warming actually in our date back to the same time period. Also, we can uh, note that this influence of Gulf Stream warm current uh, we can um, see that uh, Greenland and Norway are on the same latitude but Greenland is covered with ices although Norway is quite warm in summer and we can see many plants in summer which is due to the Gulf Stream activity also scientists say that uh, there was a Soviet uh, scientific expedition on Satko ship uh, ice breaking ship and they determined that the Gulf Stream waters got into the North Arctic Ocean two or twelve, uh, ten or twelve thousand years ago. Approximately the same uh, conclusions were made by American scientists who studied the volcanic ashes that can be found in deposits of Atlantic Ocean. They also come to the conclusion that the age of these deposits is about twelve thousand years. Thank you very much, Olga. Also, there is a question which asked ourselves is what continental sediments can show that here in this area there used to be an island because since it's uh, it used to be a dry land, the sediments should be different. Indeed, the professor Eving from Columbia University in 1949 he studied the mountain range in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and he actually discovered a prehistorical coastal sand. It was kind of very unusual because usually it is brought by rivers and it cannot just be found in uh, the ocean on the depths. So this is the evidence that there used to be a dry land which submerged. Also, there is a, there is a drawing, we can show it on the screen, which shows us the quotimentary uh, freezing sediments here on this map it's not typical uh, great amount of sediment uh, which are not typical for this area and uh, the age is uh, unfamiliar and geologists just assume that these sediments could have brought by icebergs but if those were icebergs then why they show they left this material exactly in this place in this location also in 1949 american scientists determined found a very interesting artifact uh, when they done uh, underwater drilling 
uh, it was taken from the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean near the Azores, and it was remarkable that these discs uh, were handmade. These discs are uh, had uh, holes in the middle. They were flat uh, on the surface, and they were not flat inside them, which indicates that they were made by coal. And also, uh, the ve a very interesting conclusion which uh, Lamont Observatory made uh, uh, Columbia University is that this petrification of limestone could originate from the open air, not underwater. So these discs, uh, limestone discs, were made by people, and probably it was exactly on the dry land of um, Azor, uh, Azores, and uh, these uh, limestone pieces were created 12,000 years ago. Another evidence is uh, the lava on the dry land, which was found in 1998. French ships were supposed to lay cables uh, on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, and they found volcanic deposits uh, at the depths of 3,160 meters, and they could uh, they managed to photograph them, but these. Uh, pieces could only be created on the surface, according to scientific research. Also, there are a lot of facts that indicate that there is Atlantic uh, flora and f uh, flora sediments, which show that uh, there used to be an island in the Atlantic Ocean. There was a book called Commodore Captain uh, Commander uh, by Mitrofanov, and uh, this book sh uh, in the gave such an information that uh, they were they suddenly found corals and uh, an uh, abrupt elevation of the depths of the bottom of the sea they took the bottom material from this from the depths of 1280 meters and these uh, branches of corals usually are found on the depths at the depths of about 50 meters because it's a light loving uh, plant they found it at a very very low depths and the whole valley of corals was discovered this indicates that the bottom the ocean bed descended more than 1000 meters so we can make a conclusion that it was a disastrous uh, descent and some uh, really uh, like catastrophe happened actually also there is a very, uh, very interesting set of data as Lisa already mentioned there are numerous expedition data and uh, these are the data which yeah, which they mentioned about the foraminifera uh, these layers of these uh, plant deposits uh, various densities in the Atlantic Ocean. In some localities they appear, in some localities they disappear, but, for example, on the uh, lower depths, which are not typical for this uh, plant, these are thermophilic plants, but the depth is showing that it's a colder uh, condition, they're called the conditions, so these plants could not uh, could not be existing there. So we can say that in the past this layer could be on the same level, but there was some uh, elevation of the bottom of the ocean, and some places on the contrary, the bottom went down. This is what can what we can say about this form and appearance. Also, there is uh, uh, information about the same species, uh, similar species, which are not found in the center of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, although they are cold loving. In the center of the Atlantic Ocean, they used to be warm in the past, or there was the dry land. Also, there are interesting data given by the Geological Laboratory of Lamont in the USA, and they say that over the last 10,000 years, uh, a fast transformation of this cold loving for aminophers was, uh, they were uh, changing into thermophilic, so the heating of the Atlantic Ocean was abrupt, and this indicates that the climate change was quite drastic and quite sharp. 
And this indicates again that there was some a disaster that caused such a climate change. Also, there are very interesting data from the Swedish scientists that on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, when they were doing the test drilling, uh, the albatross uh, sheep found uh, uh, freshwater plants uh, at the depths of 3,219 meters. And the head of the expedition, Professor Hans Petersen, made a conclusion that definitely in this place there was an island because freshwater plants cannot live in the Atlantic Ocean, especially in such a depth. Olga mentioned that it's a very interesting piece of information that such plants have been found. This indicates not that there, is, that there was island, but also that this island submerged very fast, because if submerging was slower, these organic materials and uh, surface plants, they will be just dissolved and tur turned into some chemicals, but we wouldn't found sediments. But since this submerging was very fast, uh, we could find, people could find such sediments, such traces of the former civilizations. Also, on the same albatross city, uh, albatross sheep, they could, they found river shells, which are in to be in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So definitely, there used to be dry land. Yes, we mentioned the plants which are found in the ocean, but also there are interesting data about the fauna of the Azores. So, according to the information which is available since uh, 1997, uh, most of the bushes and plants which can be found on Azores are not found in Europe. Some of them just found in Europe in some depository kind of form. But such kind of uh, plants are found on the neighboring islands, and this can ind indicate that such islands, these islands like Azores, Madeira, Canaries, they used to be a part of a big a one big uh, island in the Atlantic. Also, there is a very interesting mystery of this area, is the um, place where the freshwater eels uh, are found. Basically, freshwater eels usually live in fresh waters, but they can travel uh, and uh, many fish actually, uh, many eels actually keep genetic memory of the rivers where they live and they turn, tend to go back to the rivers they live. So basically, these eels from Europe, they go to the ocean, to the Atlantic Ocean, then they go all the way to the Bermuda Islands for some reason, although there is no river at all, and scientists, biologists, they are puzzled why freshwater eels are acting like that. Perhaps uh, they are going to the river, which now is on already not existing because it was in the Atlantis. Also, there is a very interesting mystery of petrels. The behavior of petrels cannot be understood by scientists either. Petrels, these are birds, they are flying near Azor Islands, Azores, and they fly to Bermuda Triangle as if they want to land on this dry land. Uh, they kind of remember the place of the dry land, but unfortunately there is no dry land anymore in this place. And also exactly the direct proof of the Atlantis existence is the archaeological finds. We should mention that most of the expedition to this region is conducted by military people. And geological expeditions were quite you know, limited in their in research. Many scientists were uh, faced contradiction from the administration, from the government, when they tried to do some researches in that place. In Google Maps, 2012, near the Azores, we can we can we could see on the maps some kind of buildings or structures. But now, if you look at the modern maps on the Google, there are no buildings and structures anymore in this place. But there is a very interesting object to the southeast of the Azores. Here you can see rectangular kind of structures. 
which are definitely, you know, they were definitely not built in order to be submerged. Uh, they were high, highly technological, and uh, it looks like some highly technological works have been done on the seabed. So what kind of archaeological finds show that there was a big, huge island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? On the underwater play, uh, place of the Azor Plateau, in 2001, uh, American and Spanish geologists found structure which looked like uh, supposedly a temple with nine columns and also with five channels, circular channels with bridges. And also there are four groups of buildings between the channels, which also resemble temples. These structures resemble the Plato's description of the main temple on Elysium. This information was published in one of the scientific journals. Could you please show the previous slide? According to one of the editor-in-chiefs of this journal who trace, uh, follow all the Atlantic expeditions, there are some photographs of this structure on the bottom of the uh, Atlantic Ocean. But uh, as long as they were doing the research, American Navy agency made this information secret, information secret. So scientists failed to know more about this information. And uh, Russian uh, scientists tried to verify this information, but unfortunately they couldn't do that. Soviet uh, scientist Gromnitsky in 1980s, he participated in an expedition and uh, a person uh, delved uh, to the archipelago and he also found um, structures uh, that indicate that they are not of natural origin so there is a central island with uh, the central temple which as it uh, as we can assume it was the center the main place of that land but on the coast of the atlantic ocean we can also find numerous you know structures underwater which can show that there are there were places around the atlantic which were also subordinate to the atlantis to the main island these are the data which we found also we, uh, there are surely many more facts that indicate that the island did exist in the middle of the atlantic ocean uh, as for me i don't have any doubts about that but we can see by we can see this from ancient maps uh, that also take the memory of this island also we shouldn't doubt that it this island was you know kind of uh, sub, it submerged very fast very fast there were no there, there was nothing like that during the last 12,000 years and we can uh, we cannot even judge of the scope of the disaster that took place what um, what uh, what we wonder about is who lived on this island the island was which was described in so many myths and how this all information relates to our civilization and the question is whether the same story which happened in this can happen to our civilization nowadays also to summarize i can say that there is a big question why information about the central island of atlantis is so secret kept in such a secret and why the mentions about it explain that it's kind of a natural descent but now we know that it's Elysium it's a place uh, a center of evil and the center of evil was actually destroyed that's why Atlantis was submerged what do ancient legends of peoples of the world tell us how broad are the circles that spread from the flood in the mythological memory? All in all, over 500 legends of this kind are known in the world. In the rainforest of Malaysia, the Chiwan people believe that time to time their world, which they called Earth-7, is turned upside down. The legend of ancient Greece says that there were four races on Earth before present mankind, and each one was observed by a geological cataclysm at the appointed hour. Ancient Egyptian legends also mention the Great Flood. In China, for example, past eras was called Kiss. At the end of each kiss, the sea leaves their coastlines. Human beings and everything else die, and the ancient traces are erased. The myth of the Hopi Indians said that the Third world ended in a universal flood in the book Maya, Popul Vuh. 
flooding is associated with heavy hail, black rain, fog, and indescribable cold. Sacred Buddhist book speaks of the seven suns. Each of them is destroyed by water, fire, or wind. The legends of the aborigines of Sarwak or Sawak from ocean area remind us that six suns have died. The world is now being lit by the seventh sun. In the history of the Dakota Indians, the Iroquois myth is told of how sea and water once came to earth destroying all human life. The inhabitants of the Tierra del Fuego said the sun and the moon fell from the sky, and the Chinese said that the planet has changed their direction. In the hymn of the Viracocha, recorded by Pachacutianki, there is the term Anacocha, literally means the sea from above, which had direct relation to the starry sky. Yet whatever this myth means, the sources of the impended flood were somewhere outside in the astronomical sphere. Also, today we know that besides myths and legends that we have today, there are different predictions which uh, now are coming true. That is the time of head uh, crosshair, which uh, ancient people talked about and wrote about. And today we can see the signs of the uh, time of the end which happen nowadays. The time is uh, accelerating and uh, uh, catastrophes began. And th these are signs which were described uh, in different uh, written sources. And one of the main signs of this, now I would like to show the video about the signs end of the time. Harbingers of the end days. Terrifying events, earthquakes in various places, acceleration of time. In the Gospel of Luke it is said, there will be great earthquakes, famines and plagues in various places, as well as terrifying events, including significant signs from heaven. In Islam, it is also mentioned about the Judgment Day, al qiyamah In the Hadith, it is said that the Prophet, may Allah bless and welcome him, said, the hour will not happen until earthquakes increase in number and time passes quickly. The Puranas, a sacred text of ancient Hindu literature, these ancient legends say about the horrors of the end of Kali Yuga, that during this period the citizens will suffer greatly from cold, wind, heat, rain and snow. They will be further tormented by quarrels, hunger, thirst, disease and severe anxiety. Actually, many processes in our lives have a certain regularity. They are cyclical. And many of us are aware of such cycles as 24 hours or one year, 365 days, but there are longer cycles. And now we will uh, delve deeper into these cycles. So if we look at the official version of history, then briefly, everything was developing gradually. In other words, in the linear form. And our civilization is the top of the evolution. Everything was beginning 5,000 years ago uh, from ancient Sumerians. And we were able to pollute the atmosphere with uh, dirt, with um, greenhouse gases that we caused global warming. And we should uh, immediately stop uh, flying planes, driving cars, and of course, pay a lot of taxes in order to compensate for the greenhouse gas emissions. But fortunately, when the glaciers just started to uh, melt, um, 
scientists were able to drill a hole and they were able to um, to get this kind of uh, sample that you can see in the image and they collected very important information and this information will help us to understand this phenomenon of cyclicity of cycles so usually the information about the past of our planet is collected from sediments on the floor of the ocean, from rings on the cuts of different uh, trees and on different samples when you drill uh, holes in ice, in, for example, in Greenland and in Antarctic. And the latter one are very interesting because they have a lot of information about the temperature, about the atmosphere and even about the magnetic field of the Earth. Today we have two main projects, the European project for ice uh, coring in Antarctica and Vostok, well, from another pole, of course. And we managed to collect data about the, um, the recent 420,000 years. Image 2 shows us the comparison of the temperature um, based on the samples of both cores, both both uh, holes, uh, in relation to the core of the planet. Why is it necessary to compare the graphs from two poles? It is important because it testifies to the global scale of changes, because uh, this way we can see immediately what is happening on the planet as a whole. And also these graphs show clearly the figures, figures of different uh, length. They have different colors so that we can see where these indicators uh, change at the same time. So we see cycles within cycles, 100,000 years, 41,000 years, uh, 26,000 years and 5,000 years, which uh, the Maya were focusing in their calendar. If we speak about the ice ages, we must remember about the Serbian scientist Milutin Milankovic. Please um, let's have a look at um, um, this uh, picture. So he's famous for the theory of ice ages. And this theory is about the following, that from time to time when the parameters of our orbit changes, our planet passes through uh, recurrent ice ages and they are known as Milankovitch cycles. Let's have a look at what these parameters are. The first one is the precession of the Earth core. By definition, precession is the, um, is the phenomenon where the, the axis changes its uh, position in space. We can find the similar we can find a similar phenomenon when we spin a wheel and when it changes the when it changes the um, their direction so you can see that the waves or the are the same as when the planet has so the the full circle is about 20 the six years old, uh, 25, 920 years, to be more precise. This second, the second parameter is orbital eccentricity. In other words, this is the how compact the orbit is. The orbit is not uh, a circle, it is elliptical. I mean, the uh, the orbit of the Earth around the circle. And according to this theory, the eccentricity changes every 413 years because of the gravity pull of such planet giants as Jupiter and Saturn. And the third parameter which we would like to focus on is, is the exile tilt from the perpendicular surface of the planet. In other words, if, for example, if we see the um, the the tilt between, well, um, let's have a look at the picture. So we see in the picture nine, let's have a look at this picture, yes. The smaller the angle is, the uh, hotter the temperature on the pole is because the pole is closer to the sun. And we'll be able to see the full um, process in the next image. So this image shows us three parameters which we have now seen, plus the force of solar radiation. And the stages of Earth Ice Age 
Um, and also they show us this, the cycles of these processes. So there are short cycles, which we are aware of. There is night and day. There are other cycles. And these cycles are determined by how much the Earth is uh, revolves around its axis and uh, how it revolves around the sun. So we have considered large-scale cycles, but what about uh, but what about uh, the cycles that uh, destroyed the Atlantis? Matt, maybe you are aware of the cycle that destroyed Atlantis. Thanks, Alexei. Great breakdown there. It was absolutely fantastic. When we look at ancient structures around the world that we still get access to that aren't deep underneath the ocean, as we mentioned, um, it was brought up that ocean levels were significantly lower during the last ice age known as the Younger Dryas period. In fact, ocean levels were around 400 feet lower than they are today. So the structures that we still have evidence for that are on the surface have been studied somewhat extensively. And what they find that's really the most amazing to me is that one of the main focuses of these ancient civilizations, when we find megalithic precision and sophistication in those structures, that prove that they're older than this more modern time frame that we're we're looking at this five or six thousand year time frame, but but obviously they're because of the evidence we're seeing and their sophistication and the way that they were built, we and the evidence from the cataclysms and disasters that have sometimes melted and burned these structures, we know that they're much older. And one of the most co common things we find the themes in these civilizations is that they needed an astronomical temple as their focal point. They, these ancient cultures realized that these cycles occur on a basis of about every 12,000 years or so. And because of that, instead of being wiped out, they knew that the most significant thing that they could do was to not only map the heavens to know when they were coming, but also to be ready for them and be able to disseminate that knowledge to pass it on so that if that culture was destroyed, that that later culture would be able to carry on that torch of that previous one. So what, you know, what is going on with these cycles? How do they, what's causing them and, and what is this disaster that destroyed Atlantis? One of the most amazing things about when you study these temples today, go look at Gobekli Tepe or Menorca off of Spain or Malta or anywhere throughout the Mediterranean or in these ancient areas, we find that these temples, in order to be a functional temple to study the heavens, to understand these cycles, is the first thing you'd have to do is align yourself with magnetic north and south. That would be the first and most important thing because then, once you did that, you could have this accurate way to, to assess and watch the movement of the cosmos to track what is known as this great year, this 26, about 26,000 year cycle between what is spread across the 12 different zodiacs. And those cycles are about 2,100 years per zodiac. And these cultures knew that. But what's fascinating is that when they study these temples that were mapping those changes, they find that they're no longer matching magnetic north and south. All over the world, almost every single one of these temples, when they, when they first when they identify that they're older than some of the more primitive ones that were built later, they find that they're all off from magnetic north and south by about 23 degrees. And what that means is that when those temples were built, that when they had aligned to north and south, they were exactly dead on north to, to magnetic north and south. For them to be off by 23 degrees on a global scale means that we had a disaster so significant, or disasters, I will point out, maybe multiples over the course of a 12 to 24,000 year over the last two processional cycles, what we're looking at is those changes to mag magnetic north and south, because they don't align up anymore, shows you that those shifts were so significant that where we now have north and south magnetically is in a different place than it used to be back then. And that gives us a glimpse, especially when we look at things like studying ley lines, these energetic convergence zones across the world, they're no longer in the same place either. So what we find is that there was a massive shift in the magnetic field of the earth and so that it's no longer in the same position that it used to be back then but what's brilliant about that is it gives us a ballpark to understand when those temples were built because all we have to do is study when those alignments matched up with magnetic north and south and then we know when they were built it gives us this time frame so what happened right there's been a lot of really good information mentioned by a lot of these speakers over the last several minutes talking about what causes these cycles. And I would 
absolutely agree with everything that's been said. It seems like it's focused around this movement of the of our solar system within the cosmos and how the sun goes through these grand solar maximums and grand solar minimums changes where it flares up and becomes strong and then it gets weaker over time and every one of those shifts we go from being really warm on the planet to being plunged into an ice age and, and up and down vice versa and that's why we find no ancient megalithic structures across the, the far northern hemisphere none because they were, they were buried under ice. And those ancient cultures would have known not to build there. And so today we find this area across the central part of our planet, around the Mediterranean, Turkey, Mesopotamia, Egypt, across, across the other side of the Atlantic to you know, places like in, um, in Peru and Bolivia and South America, up through, up through the Americas. All these megalithic structures are built al along that area, showing us that that was where the climate was favor favorable at that time. And they knew that if they built there, that those ice caps that would accumulate every 12,000 years would, or depending on which cycle you're in, would not affect them. And so these ancient cultures were brilliant. They understood all these aspects of our world and cycles that we're just beginning to understand today. And so in terms of Atlantis, one of the things that's interesting about it is, like it's men been mentioned, how it's in the, in the Atlantic Ocean, in the area that's today the Azores, we find this interaction of three different plates that come together along this mid-Atlantic ridge that stretches across the middle of the Atlantic. If you imagine a continent on that spot, it would really be one of the worst locations on the planet if you had one of these cycles occur. Because the closer you are in proximity to these locations, the more damage and and the more intense those cataclysms would be. It doesn't mean that if you weren't near them, you wouldn't have any damage. It just means that the closer you are to those epicenters of wherever those plates would move would be the most dangerous place to be. And so what would happen? Well, you have if you have a magnetic north-south that are balancing this our planet, think of it as this perfect balance. And if you get increased amounts of solar radiation because of the sun going through these changes, blasting the planet what you have is those poles start to shift and there's two different types of movements that occur there's what's known as a wobble and there's what's known as a shift right now we're in a wobble and you you go up and you follow the news of what what's been going on the last couple of years and looking into the inuit of northern canada they've already talked about how the magnetic north has been starting to shift it's already moving question is how far is it going to move because there's a very fine line between a wobble and a shift before everything, all hell breaks loose. And so what we're looking at is, you know, are we at that point where that is going to be prevented or is this going to continue the way it's going? So what happened to Atlantis? Well, according to records, they may have intensified a natural event that was already occurring. And we'll, and they will be getting into this later as, as people talk about some technologies and different aspects of what Atlantis had. But Either way, Atlantis, this continent that Plato described, being on the epicenter of these plate changes, as that those things were occurring with the magnetic north and south changing, and then having tectonic plates all start moving and volcanism across the planet, this entire continent, as just Plato described, it's not as, in a, as, as if a tsunami just washed over and then destroyed it all and left it sitting there. It's actually mentioned that these events, Plato says they're so severe that the entire continent submerged and sank in the Atlantic. And we had some great analysis by, by Liza talking about those geologic processes that occur that lead to that and how all these strange anomalies out in the Azores prove that it looks like there was some kind of a continent here based on the flora and fauna and all the different types of evidence geologically that's remained in this part of the ocean. But this, so this part of Atlantis essentially, to conclude, it looks like as these violent earth changes were occurring, some parts of Atlant the Atlanteans fled the continent and created what we think of as Egypt or Chem at the time to protect this knowledge. And then those who remained on that island were wiped out and just submerged under the ocean and disappeared and became myth. And that's what we're left with is, is really by studying this, we can understand both what happened to Atlantis, but also to understand how we can prevent not only these cataclysms, but some of the mistakes and some of the things that they that those cultures did that we really do need to learn by. You know, that famous quote is 
those who can't learn from the past are destined to repeat it. And so we are at this critical moment now where we have to start taking a hard look at Atlantis. Instead of thinking of it as a myth, we have to just really get into the science of what it was so that we can understand our own story, but also understand where we're going in the future. And that's a delicate balance that I think we have to really be careful of. Thank you very much, Matt. As far as I understand from what you've said, that ancient knew about this cycle of 12,000 years. They wanted to kind of show this uh, cycle to us in the megalithical structures so that we would get this information. It's very interesting what the scientific world knows about this 12,000 year cycle. If we go back to, uh, if we address the changes that happened over the last 12,000 years, basically uh, there were sharp uh, climate change, sharp warming, a change of the uh, currents, ocean currents, a, a stoppage of the Gulf Stream, which was uh, accompanied by hurricanes and other uh, anomalies. Also, the uh, sharp increase of the ocean temperature, which we can, uh, which we know from the sediment data, and also disastrous floods that uh, are indicated by the sediments which are found in various parts of the world, and also a speedified uh, sediment uh, layers. As mentioned, mentioned, there was the sharp uh, change of the magnetic field activity and also the volcanic and uh, tectonic processes uh, were get act more active. And scientists uh, also detected the demographic disaster out of uh, 500 million, um, 500 million uh, uh, people population they decreased to 50 million, at least according to the current scientific data. So, uh, actually, uh, now uh, when I was reading about this information, actually, it all it is all repeated now. It is what we see on the uh, news. This is actually what is happening to our civilization right now. Many scientists already calculated and have a scientific understanding that there is a cycle of 12,000 years and after the end of each of these cycles there is a disaster and please turn on the video despite the uh, taboo in the scientific world many scientists say that today uh, that on the planet everything happens with a certain cyclicity including the global climate change a logical question arises of course of global cataclysm, what are the cycles in fact? Cyclicity is the basis of the existence of humanity and the universe. Cyclicity comes from the Greek word kiklo, a circle, a combination of interconnected dominant processes that make a complete circle of development within a certain period of time. Naturally, the activity of many natural processes on the planet Earth depends on the cosmic cycles. Brunyanka Vladimir studied the cycles of the development of Earth, astrophysical, geological, biological, and historical. It turned out that all of them subordinate to the great cycle of the change of uh, ages, which lasts 11,911 years. This is the number uh, equivalent to the periods of rotation of all the planets around the Sun. But Turin Alexander Mikhailovich asserted that planets rotate around their center of masses in the direction perpendicular to the flatness of their orbit. As a result of such rotation, the Earth is from time to time rotates in space uh, up to, uh, on 360 circular degrees. And uh, actually, global catastrophes take place due to this with a period of 12,166 years. The main reason of the climate change today is the change that takes place on the Sun, but the climate change on Earth can also have a galactic origin also, which relates to the transition of the Sun and the solar system through a spiral, uh, spiral sleeves or galaxy. In the scientific work of Petrov Nikolai Vasilievich, the climate change uh, is described from the position of the preservation of life in space. 
the uh, constant nature of the parameters on uh, of the environment on the crosses crusts of the earth uh, including climate uh, has an auxiliary nature and uh, the rotation around the center of galaxy has the period of 2000 uh, 217 million years. It turns out that during this period, the solar system makes uh, 8,000 zodiacal uh, spirals on the spiral trajectory. Thanks to this, the recent the changing of polarity of the external magnetic field changes, and uh, our uh, solar system, uh, every uh, 13,000 years, our planetary system switches from magnetic field of the Milky Way of one, uh, one zodiacal sign to another. Now we have the transition from the constellation of Leo to the constellation of Aquarius. This means the deregulator of the energetical state of the solar system is the informational magnetic field of our galaxy. Every 12,000 years, the sun goes through these periods of time when the inner nucleus of energy within itself goes through these flare up events. And then just, and everything's always about this balance cycle in, in the cosmos. Everything follows that, where it, it flares up and gets hot, and then it goes through a period where it gets cool. And that's known as a grand solar maximum to a grand solar minimum, and then continuing that. That's how it works. And what it tells us is that the ancient people knew that when these cycles happen, they can often come with great destruction. Like the big question is really, what is the reason for it? And Matt already mentioned that the polar, polar poles are shifting, and we know about that. And essentially, the researchers, the true researchers, were making investigation in this field and there is a knowledge about that. But as one author said, the US government discovered what is going on in the 40s and closed up this information in the 50s. But thanks to their patience and deep like work and document preservation of D. White, who was leading uh, the Arctic mission in a uh, in the early 20th century, and they found very interesting information about poles. So uh, the next slide, please. The, what they found, it's essentially that pole is mobile. And the next one, the D white story, and the pole is mobile. And it is the previous slide, please. That they found that the pole is mobile and it is moving. And the most importantly, that this pole shift are tied to cyclicity. So the information they found that they found nine alternating layers uh, uh, connecting to the last five catastrophes and relating to the mechanism, how this happens. It seems to be that pole flips and flips very fast and the tilt might be up to nine degrees, and then it goes back to the same position. It's what they are saying. And they say that even like because of that reason, we observe the pole practically at the same location. And we have impression that pole is not shifting. And practically the same information was said by Chen Thomas in, uh, in, the, in his book, uh, which was classified. The next slide, please. So the concept is pretty simple. On the next slide, you will see that in general, we believe that earth crust, it is super thin layer of the rock and it is supported by molten, but molten, by molten magma. But in fact, if this would be true, then crust would not be locked it would be just moving around back and forth. And what is happening in reality, there is thin layer under the earth crust, under the rock, where we have molten rock and melting rock. And underneath of that so-called plastic rocks. And these two thin layers essentially keep crust fixed. Uh, on a slide, you can see that in a normal state, essentially these two layers make a friction so that uh, on the next slide, so that this, uh, this crust cannot, cannot move. Uh, 
And this is happening in a normal way, in, an, in a normal conditions between cycles. But these thin layers is super, super sensitive to the ele electromagnetic wave, to the temperature. And on the next slide, like you can see that in the case, if this rock would be, if any kind of conditions like any cosmic events, micronovas, solar outbreaks, or magnetic wave, they would, would be changed so that this molten rock, which creates friction, this may start to behave like a liquid. And in this case, we have a liquid and which supports which supports the solid layer. And here and there, we will see the local spikes in the form of earthquakes, in the form of volcanoes. Seems to be it's what we observe right now. And this, this is according to the, uh, to the offers, this is a key explanation of this cyclicity. So it seems to be some external factors may cause these changes on the earth and it's very interesting what is really going on. Thank you. So Anastasia, thank you very much. We can see that the real reason of cyclicity is the, or, uh, the origin of the astronomical process. And what is happening right now to our planet is actually happening to other planets of, uh, of the uh, solar system. Please turn on the other uh, part of the video. Galaxy is a, uni a unified magnetic system that interacts with other objects in the galaxy, including the solar system. Any uh, significant change in galaxy is reflected on the sun and influences all processes, not only on the Earth, but on other planets of the solar system. Earth is not the only planet in the solar system that undergoes climate change. Uh, on Pluto, dark spots are growing on Uranus, uh, the intensity of light is changing and ice caps are melting on Mars. So the change is happening in the entire solar system. The proof that CO2 is not the main impetus for the warming on our planet is the fact that simultaneously other planets and satellites of the planets of the solar system also are heating, are warming. Although there is no uh, emission of any uh, greenhouse gases. Mars, Triton, Jupiter all demonstrate global warming. So, Sun and the solar system are influenced by numerous facts. These facts should be taken into account because they influence the climate change. As it is said in the report on the, glo on the problems of uh, consequences of global climate change on Earth, effective ways to change these problems, natural science, the mistake is that scientists of the previous years, they didn't take into account the growing acceleration of the universe, the cosmic factors and astronomical processes and how they influence the planet. They influence not the sun, not only the sun, but also the planets of the solar system, including Jupiter, the uh, giant planet. The global climate change on Earth is uh, the consequence of astronomical processes, uh, processes and their cyclicity, which is inevitable. The geological history of our planet evidences that Earth survived such phases of global climate change many times. I agree that we are living in the period of climatic change, and I already mentioned that I agree with that, because normally, you know, there is a synonym that it's a global warming, uh, kind of everybody knows to the anthropogenic factor. As for this second uh, interpretation with the anthropogenic factor, I can argue with that, but I truly agree that we live in the age of climate change. And from my point of view, what is the change actually uh, lies in? Uh, actually, it's increasing contrast in uh, weather anomalies. Owing to the knowledge of Alatra, given in the report on the problems and consequences of global climate change on Earth, we understand that not only the sun is the reason for climate change, but it's a cyclic processes in space that take place all the time and reflects on the planets as climatic disasters. We as humanity are already in the active phase of this cycle. Yes, friends, as we just have seen from the video and as previous speakers have said before, what we see outside the window is really 
derivative of astronomical cyclical processes. But the question arises, why is our attention so much focused on this, I would say, hyped myth about CO2? Because, for example, Alexei showed graphs at the beginning of his speech, and I would also like to give one of the graphs right now. This is just the data taken from the course from the Vostok station. So what we are seeing now is a change, a cyclical change in temperature and CO2 concentration. And now pay attention to this blue column. It shows that according to the data from this core, the temperature first increased and only after that the amount of CO2 changed and also increased. This is just the opposite. Not as we are told now that the CO2 that humanity produces through its activities, it stimulates the increase in temperature on Earth. That's what should be noted. The shift between the temperature graph and the CO2 graph it could be up to several hundred years. That is, first the temperature increased, and only after a few hundred years the concentration of carbon monoxide increased. That was known even in 1987. There was a publication in the very famous journal Nature, published in October of this year, where scientists just showed that there is a certain cyclicity integral periods and the cyclicity it shows change a cyclical change in co2 and it absolutely refutes the influence of the anthropogenic factor on the global climate change that we see now it should be noted that the journal nature is the one where all publications are really reviewed they are subject to preliminary review. And well, let's say, it already has a certain reputation and has established itself. In this regard, the question arises. Why if there is already evidence, and they were already absolutely known to everyone for a long time, irrefutable geological evidence, why is the myth about CO2 so imposed on us? In other words, it turns out that all of humanity should shift its attention from real problem, what is happening now with us, what is happening with the climate and what really is a serious threat to all of humanity. They turn our attention to changing their way of life. For example, certain plastic there, or producing less CO2 emissions, or switching to green energy, and so on. Plus, there are some fees to pay, which is exactly what Alexei was talking about. Let's just think about it. Why is this happening, and who benefits from it in general? And what pay attention to now, and direct all our efforts as humanity. Maybe there is a video? Yes. And I just wanted to ask you to put a video to continue my words that scientists know this. And scientists are already openly talking about this. Talking about this. And people don't know the chronology of historical events that allows to impose lies on them about changes that supposedly never happened before. But this is simply not true. The fact that concentration of carbon dioxide has increased is quite certain. I will now add that 65 million years ago it, it was 15 times more. Now it is 0.01% more and everyone is talking about it. But there were times in the history of our planet when it was 15 times more. And what did we see? Dinosaurs were big. During the interglacial periods, there is an increase in temperature and the amount of CO2, whereas the temperature is the first to rise, and in between there may be decades of delay. I made my own analysis based on primary data from the Vostok well. You can clearly see that first the temperature increases, and then the methane and CO2 level arise, not vice versa. 
you can also see the CO2 is not a driving force, but the result of temperature changes. I don't want to talk about politics, but unfortunately it cannot be left out, because the authorities are using the topic of global warming and climate change in their political interests. Allegedly, a person affects global warming. A person does not affect global warming. This is all a myth, but well organized, you know, all humanity is intimidated. You will not be able to determine what kind of impact people have if you don't know how much the climate naturally changes. And not only that, but also the human factor is so little that you cannot even determine it. And that is a problem. And so, just to illustrate this point, for example, in a Greek, which is, by the way, gives fig figures showing how much CO2 people produce each year, which is very alien and dangerous for science. The increase in methane content, which is now being talked about, and the increase in carbon dioxide content is well within the overall picture of increasing the deep degasing of the planet. But this addition of 1% of carbon dioxide could not have any impact on the weather, the climate or any other factors. As we have just seen, researchers speak openly about the fact that it is not our civilization that has influenced the global warming. And I think we must uh, truly consider this, consider how the global warming and the climate change is influencing civilizations. And I would like to shift to the following question as uh, cycles of civilizations. And in order to um, discuss it, let's have a look at a couple of examples that destroy the theory of linear development of civilizations. And we will have archaeological findings as a proof. For example, the Great Sphinx in Egypt, everyone knows it. It has been, um, it has been created out of uh, one big rock. And Professor Dr. Robert Schock from Boston University at the beginning of 1990s impressed everyone with his statement um, he actually um, he did, he studied the water erosion on the Sphinx. So the Sphinx body experienced uh, prolonged rains, and the problem was that actually the last time when such conditions happened in Egypt were from eight to twelve thousand years ago, and geologists agree to that. They agree to this evident facts of water erosion, but actually. It, um, it provides a very inconvenient uh, basement for, uh, the, for Egyptologists and because they think that uh, the Sphinx appeared 4,000 years ago. And another less common example is the Cambay city in the Gulf of Cambay. It's the uh, Gulf of uh, Arabian Sea. And this is a real city that was discovered 17 years ago, one seven. And, um, um, it is difficult to study it because it is below the sea, well, sea level at 40 meters. And uh, people believe that the Harappian civilization was the uh, used to be the ancient one, the most ancient one. But um, people found that uh, this uh, city was built, for example, existed 9,500 years ago. And uh, of course, now it's not the Harappian civilization that is the oldest. And I would like to logically say that probably these structures that uh, we see at, on the screen right now, probably they haven't been built below the water surface. Probably the theory is that they had been sunken. So again, it um, destroys the theory of the linear development of civilization because um, the, the water levels were rising so quickly around the last ice age around 12,000 years ago and another thing is that i would like to comment on is that we have have not yet learned how to build such uh, mm, well proportioned uh, buildings that reflect constellations and cosmic processes and 
we don't have these technologies and uh, the technologies that were used were like they use stone blocks up to 200,000 tons. Right now, there are just two cranes that are capable of working with these loans. They are um, huge uh, equipment with um, that are very, very complex. And in order to do this, to use this equipment, um, a lot of time and uh, man hours are required. So simply speaking, our modern builders, despite the fact that they have all the advanced technologies, they are unable to lift uh, weight up to 200 tons. And to summarize everything, I would like to say the following. It is impossible to deny the cosmic cycles that are related to planet movements. And information about uh, this cyclicity is uh, contained in the ice, and we see that every 12,000 years, radical changes happen on Earth that change the faith of our Earth. And what are the proofs? Megalithic cities, maps with um, non-existent uh, continents, and cities that have sunk. And of course, all these megalithic structures show us the deep knowledge of the cosmic process that have been happening for a lot of time for a long time that are more than um, that have been that are really really old and uh, the fact that uh, these uh, structures are were made by ancient civilizations and probably it cannot be arg argued by the fact that uh, we have collected the data and presented the facts that we have presented to you so thing is that civilizations have been developing for many millennia and there is a cyclicity of global catastrophes that change the face of earth forever and there is cyclicity and there are civilization and civilization passed the knowledge accumulated to future civilizations and they uh, inscribe this knowledge into these megalithic st structures. On um, image 25, we'll be able to see the comparison of these civilizations and how they're reflected in history. So, if all of us, the entire humanity, stop looking at the legacy of our ancestors, and uh, if we consider ourselves, because of our pride, the top of uh, evolution development, if we ignore their message, if we ignore their warning about the um, uh, the future cataclysms, we will not have a chance to uh, live the future cataclysms. But if we listen to our ancestors, then we will be able to survive. Now let's have a look at the Megalith video. In South America, there are traces of a similar cataclysm dating back to the same period of time the 11th million BC, in the South American Andes, in the mountains, at 4,200 meters above sea level, geologists have found traces of marine sediments. In the same area, some of the ruins in Tivanaca, at 4,300 meters, were covered with a 2-meter layer of liquid mud. The source of the flooding couldn't be found. We can see that this all was dragged and piled up by some force. There is no doubt, Tiwanaka's death was caused by a natural disaster that occurred more than 12,000 years ago. Scientists are endlessly arguing about the nature of this singularity. But what is really essential is that with all this variety of legends, the main thing is always passed on to the descendants, namely there was a global catastrophe that almost completely destroyed mankind and that these events happen cyclically, and they are connected with cosmic factors. And now we have faced these processes. We are living in times of global climate change, which happen every 12,000 years. Various megalithic structures and legends of the people of the world are trying to warn us about this.
Right, I fully agree with what Alexei has said, and I agree that our ancestors, the ancient civilization, right, it gave us this important information since we have deciphered that. And I would also like to point out about such megalithic uh, uh, building structures as uh, also about uh, some special lane, right? Um, let us. Uh, watch the photos so you might uh, have already seen such interesting blocks megalithic uh, blocks right and you can see that all these blocks are really very different and uh, really each of these blocks is unique and what is it notable by what this lane is notable by uh, it is first of all that uh, this blocks um, they they are put in special order to each other at different angles and each block actually uh, has such a pressure which are just uh, um you know as uh, by usual building right but here each block has um, pressure in different directions right so the whole construction in general it is so to say um, really very well distributed and it, it gives some stability to it and uh, it says that our ancestors they also um, put uh, um, well some um, kind of um, Okay, the, the message construction is really stable, and you can see that one. Uh, okay, the angles uh, they uh, they were made by special blocks, and e even uh, right each block might weigh uh, just from a few tons to few just uh, tens of tons, and uh, if you just write down you, on the photo, you can see. Uh, great massive blocks and uh, also on the, just at the uh, angle um, rectangular blocks were used to, at the angle building right and uh, also uh, for some stability uh, uh, there was used uh, a special technique and if you can just yeah l let us watch uh, um, this photo so you might uh, watch it on the photos so um these um uh, just uh, particular buildings uh, right they were built in a special form uh, so these are like um it just they're different combination um of the different combination of these blocks so you can see that kind of wall it, it kind of uh, was able to support itself um, just according to this um, construction so this lane actually of blocks was um, alongside um, alongside uh, some kind of rock a mountain and also you can see just a photo where the limestones right and uh, mm, you can what, what's interesting about these buildings um is that uh, well these buildings were not considered to be like houses homes but they were not kind of um uh, predetermined to be uh, like you know for dwelling uh, but this lane, you know, uh, it, it, it was just kind of, uh, again, again, the, the, the rock. And also the blocks themselves, um, they were of different forms. And uh, of course, uh, they were put together, fixed together with the help of um, just special technique. And it was really very stable. So our ancients knew this. Yeah, well, it's a very interesting information and it gives us an understanding that we are far from being the first civilization and these monuments of architecture that we could see now, they really prove that there were other civilizations before us and their technologies uh, cannot be compared to what we are having now and we have not, it, it makes us think that and to rethink and to think over of that history that uh, we are taught at school. Yes, really so. 
Great, Mira. Thank you very much. Really, we had some uh, technical issues, uh, and I will also wanted to add is that what um, the ancient civilizations uh, just gave us um, just you know precious knowledge because all those megalithic building structures they were really very firm and they were constructed so uh, just exactly that these megalithic structures buildings they had been. Uh, carrying on uh, uh, just uh, for centuries, for millennia, and isn't it a good, you know, um, uh, idea to think what do we have to uh, for our next generations? What have, uh, what kind of building structures have we built, right? How can we just, uh, yeah, survive during the cataclysms, even? Yes, indeed. That's a very important question. And today with us, we have Matt, and I actually have uh, three questions to Matt. Matt, I know that you study Atlantis very, very deeply. And my question, the first question is, um, because I would like to understand how Atlanteans and Sumerian related and how we related to Atlantis as well. The second question is definitely about El. Who was El, the ruler of Elysium? And my third question is, why do you think it is important right now for us as a society to study this topic? What brings us to our modern civilization? Matt, could you please answer these three top three uh, questions? Sure, those are, those are some pretty loaded questions, Marina, but I'll do the best I can. Um, so how do we connect Atlantis to these other civilizations, right? We see this sophisticated myth of this island continent. But how is it connected to the ancient Sumerians? How is it connected to the Hittites? How is it connected to any of these ancient cultures which we can identify megalithic structures? Like we just showed a few minutes ago, looking over in Peru at some of this incredible sophistication. How does Atlantis connect to all these cultures? Well, so specifically, it really revolves around what we can find for the earliest evidence we have is the Sumerians. Because when we look at two places, sources of evidence for that, cuneiform tablets that came out of Mesopotamia, one of the most important ones that we know of is called the Sumerian King List. And the other one's called the Uruk King List. And not everybody may know about that second one. But what those basically revolve around is it tells the story of these ancient cities in Mesopotamia and how old they are and the generations of kings that lived before them. And they state that their history goes back almost over, in some cases, 200,000 years. If you were to add up every single king and understand how they're recording time in the aspect of which was known as shars, S-H-A-R, which re represented a time period of 3,600 years, which that number is also mentioned in another cuneiform tablet called the Atrahasis. So what we find is that these ancient cultures have different epics that occurred where some of them were wiped out and then they had to rebuild again. But what, one of the things that, that really stands out is that we don't have specific examples of kingship and information going from Sumer to creating Atlantis. But we know that Sumer predated Atlantis because it's stated in cuneiform tablets that Eridu in what's today known as Iraq is the oldest city ever, the first city ever created on Earth, in, and which has biblical connections to Eden. However, what we find is a gap in information after Sumer with these kings, with this emergence of this great empire, this great continent called Atlantis, which was then wiped out and then records began again. But this gap in between where we find this lost history of Atlantis seems to indicate that those many of those records may have been destroyed in, in these cataclysms and what we find in Egypt where Plato talked to Solon and Solon had the story from Egypt and then I read the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. That's some of the only evidence we have that really talks about what Atlantis was like and, and how it was connected. But really, when you lay all those pieces together, you find that Atlantis looks like when it looks like the perfection of those lost civilizations. It's when they reached the peak of their, their sophistication that would became Atlantis. It was all the megalithic sophisticated knowledge from all the cultures that culminated to this great civilization we think of as Atlantis. That's why it's talked about as being this global empire. And actually 
Plato talks about how Atlantis was essentially um, a, a continent civilization that was that ended up being warlike. And we'll get into talking about that when I mentioned L. But essentially, Atlantis was this perfection of this these lost civilizations that, that then created this empire that we we talk and look back at all the records about how it had the rise and fall based on different kings that ruled there. So getting into your second question on on who El was, when we think of Atlantis, we think of a perfect a perfect society, right? Until it became corrupted. But earlier on, the, one of the focuses and obsessions of Atlanteans became this idea of Elysium, which is this heavenly realm of the afterlife that comes beyond when we leave this mortal life. If you think about a king who's been ruling for long periods of time, maybe he's trying to even extend his life and keep him keep his alive as long as possible, the obsession would always be immortality and being able to live forever. And that was exactly what the, the obsession of the Atlanteans became, was this idea of living forever and almost connecting to these higher realms beyond even the material, physical realm that we have. And Atlanteans became obsessed over two things immortality and power and that's ultimately what led to their corruption now when you get into the greek poet um, pindar he talks about how he thinks that this ruler of elysium in atlantis known as el was possibly the greek god of chronos a god of time and that chronos was this ruler who became obsessed with with these people of atlantis of of creating power and and, and um, dominating over time and immortality and all these different aspects. And in the Critias, Plato mentions how a great war emerged, erupted out of this region where we know of, and, and many people may have heard of it, called the Titans versus the Olympians. When And who, and who were the Titans, right? Well, in these Greek stories, the Titans were the Atlanteans, and, and whereas the Olympians were the Greeks. And so the Titans were ruled and run by these different rulers like Poseidon and Kronos in, in Atlantis, these older generation gods, whereas the Olympians were ruled by these younger generation gods and they were fighting over power on how that civilization was going to run. And in the end, it states that the Greek states of the Mediterranean ended up winning the war because during this time period of them fighting and having po power struggles, Atlantis destroyed itself. Because it was, it was in this time period of these global changes, and they, evidence shows that they may have used some powerful technologies, energetic tools that may have intensified those interactions with those earth changes and annihilated themselves, literally destroyed their entire continent. And that's one of the things we find. And so your third question, Maria, I think it, did it have to do with the future or what we're, how we're looking towards or what Why was your yeah, why do you think it's important right now for us as a humanity, as a civilization, to raise such a question, to study Atlantis and their life, lifestyle and the consequences that they had? Yeah, as, as I mentioned, Atlantis is, is taught to us, if you read ancient stories, is being part of what was known as the Golden Age. It was this time period when a lot of these megalithic structures and sophistication was being built around these places in the world and the idea was that civilization at that time had focused its moral structure on knowledge and, and balance and the acquisition of just higher wisdom whereas later on power and corruption takes over and, and, and causes a civilization to have its focus shift into what many could probably reflect on today is a culture that doesn't really value wisdom and knowledge as much it becomes obsessed with controlling others power being um conquering other other nations and whenever you have a culture that focuses itself on war and conquering other nations they always collapse eventually and i mean that they always will eventually collapse because that society is unsustainable and it's not the way that societies are supposed to be run. And so Atlantis is always used as that perfect example because it was the perfect civilization that had reached the state of having an, the, the greatest understanding of our universe and our, the nature of reality and, and this world that we live in and our purpose. They reached those states. But because of certain individuals and the way that they went down the road, they became, many of the people became greatly divided. 
And I mentioned Thoth going to Egypt, the land of Chem, with a lot of their priests and um, those who are part of those secret societies who valued those, those types of mentalities of the original Atlantis. And that's why Egypt was this resurrection that was, they were trying to create another Atlantis. And essentially what happened was Atlantis was destroyed. And then later on, though that sophistication of Egypt was also destroyed in, in during cataclysms. And so men, in many ways, no culture has ever been able to achieve what Atlantis had originally achieved. And I think that, that we can learn from that in so many ways, because I think that as many have talked about as we're going into these different zodiacal periods, we're entering this time of Aquarius. And as the dualist, dualistic nature of our reality shifts towards a more positive polarity, we really should look towards the lessons from Atlantis so we can return to that golden age and achieve what Atlantis was never able to achieve. And that is reaching the next stage of a society where it bec can become global and can, we can stamp out this darkness that seems to rule so many of our past empires. Thank you. Sorry. And I would like to thank Matt for your participation. Thank you. It was really outstanding discussion and thank you very much for bringing your expertise and your passion to our today's discussion. And this puzzle about connection of Atlanteans, Sumerian and our civilization, it was really important. And we will be so happy to see you again in our show. And it's thank you very much for collaboration and thank you for all this time you spend with us. Thank you so much. It really was an honor to be on a show with all of you. I just want to specifically point out, I've never seen such an extensive look at every aspect of Atlantis and the geologic history and flora and fauna truly is one of the greatest um, collections of minds I've ever heard talk about this. So it's, it's an honor to be on the show with all of you, and I hope I can do it again soon.